cái chỗ ông chủ nhiệm ủy ban bắc to các nhóm đại diện để thi sam đại ca chỉ bắn to ông nhiệm thông báo về tình trạng chun từ cầm máy tv cà phê cà đầy lục yên sơn đi là mấy bắn to cà bằng hai nơi sẽ đại diện to là bắc luôn sớm chơi Thank you, Mr. President, Your Honors, and good afternoon again to everyone. Uh, the next category, uh, Your Honors, are documents that are listed as S-21 prisoner records. I think that this issue has been discussed extensively. It's, uh, I think our position is that anything dealing with S-21 has to be viewed with a great deal of skepticism. And if, uh, indeed, uh, Doik does come and testify that he uh, record uh, documents can be put to him for the purposes of cross examination uh, or examination. Uh, one in particular document, which is D108 slash 26.135. D108 slash 26.135 appears to be relevant to inquiry. Again, we would uh, object to it since he's been object to it being admitted since he's no longer in this particular case. But that's something that your honors will need to decide on. The ne next we have S21 confessions. Uh, one we found extensive written submissions on this issue. Our position hasn't changed. And the Nunchia team has already expressed its, its uh, reservations and objections to this sort of evidence. I don't wish to repeat what we already have submitted in the past and what has been mentioned already this afternoon, but our fundamental position is that S-21 confessions should not be admitted. They're tainted because uh, they were obtained under circumstances which under international law, uh, such evidence should not be used in courts. Then the next type of documents category are transcripts from 001. And I may go into this a little bit more extensively. Our position, Your Honors, is that 001 transcripts cannot and should not come in under any circumstances. Any witness who testified in 001 can certainly be re-invited to give evidence in this particular case. The lawyers for Doik did not put up much of a defense as far as we are concerned. The one legal issue that they may have had the jurisdictional one, was raised parenthetically during closing arguments. They had no need to challenge witnesses because effectively their client had provided all sorts of statements and effectively or purportedly was cooperating and was, uh, and was admitting to his entire guilt. So the strategy and the tactics used in 001 by the defense are certainly not the strategy and tactics used by the accused in this particular case. And I raise this because I certainly don't wish to have the lawyers for Doik uh, their, their examination of witnesses, that is, be used as a basis for su suggesting that perhaps the witnesses have been confronted and therefore need not appear. In fact, it would be the complete opposite. If the witnesses are available, they should come in and provide evidence. If they're not available, then proper submissions can be made, and perhaps 
testimony was elicited that does not go to acts and conducts of the accused, perhaps the trial chamber may consider. But our position is that transcripts cannot come in. You may recall that early on I, uh, I filed numerous submissions concerning this, I say we, on the, for the uh, inquiry defense. We did so because we knew that this is the habit, uh, the practice by the prosecutors, especially at the ICTY and the members over here come from the ICTY. What they tend to do, in minor cases, they try to sneak in as much evidence as they possibly can because the defense effectively is not interested in whether that evidence comes in or not because it may not necessarily touch upon their clients. So they get in all sorts of background information, all sorts of other information that goes unchallenged. So then the, when the next case comes in, the first thing they do is they make a submission for the trial chamber to accept adjudicated facts and also to accept testimony by way of prior transcripts. So knowing the practice and knowing uh, the players in the prosecution, we filed substantive, substantive uh, submissions concerning this issue. So our position is clear. No transcripts unless, unless the witness comes in. And the transcript doesn't come in unless it's used for impeachment or for rehabilitation purposes. The next item are site identification reports. And this was briefly touched upon by uh, the Nunchia team. In particular, to document D232-108, that's D232-108. 08 and D369 slash 38 slash 38 and our uh, submission is that uh, these site identification reports were prepared based on the OCIJ uh, witness interviews the relevant witnesses and the OCIJ investigators who prepare the reports can certainly come in and provide evidence and be subjected to cross-examination. This is nothing other than a statement as far as we're concerned, and therefore we're entitled to confront the makers of these particular reports. But the site identification reports are not merely photographs, but contain also testimony which cannot be tested unless the witness is here. And one example, for instance, is D369-38. Uh, which discusses not merely the locations for certain work sites, but also who supervises it. I don't wish to belabor the point as to the individual working for the OCP who is engaged in uh, preparing this. Suffice it to say, uh, as was pointed out, the individual would have been 10 years old or 11 years old in 1975, and therefore he could not have an independent memory of these events. Unless, of course, the individual comes and testifies that back in 1975 to 79, the individual was roaming around Phnom Penh, going from ministry to ministry, from location to location, and it was based on his personal knowledge and experience and personal observations that he was able to uh, provide 
uh, this uh, site identification report. If that is not the case, then obviously the, this individual would have relied on other documents and therefore uh, that individual should come in and give evidence if indeed the trial chamber is, uh, wishes to rely on this. Maps and, and, and photographs, that's the next topic. Uh, normally, normally, uh, a map or a photograph, uh, in order for it to be admitted, has to be a fair and accurate representation of what it purports to be at the time of the incident. That's the normal circumstances. So if we're talking about a particular building, having a photograph of a building which sat on this particular location is not necessarily relevant unless, of course, the only purpose of submitting the photograph uh, is to show that at this particular location where this building currently is located, a particular site or a particular event occurred. We see lots of photographs of new buildings. Uh, I suspect, and perhaps the prosecution will tell us uh, the purpose of them, but if, if uh, if the purpose is to demonstrate what the building looked like or what the site looked like at the time, then a foundation would have to be established. One particular document, D108-39, uh, D. 108-39-8 is titled Genocide Sites in Cambodia 1975-79 authored by Susan E. Cook and Matthew Flatland of the Cambodian Genocide Program, Yale University. Now here's why we object to a document of this nature. When you look at the introduction, I will read parts of it to give your honors a flavor as to why these sorts of documents are inadmissible. Unless, of course, the author wishes to come in and testify about the substance in the article of this report. So in the introduction, very first line, the Cambodian Genocide Program, CGP, is a genocide documentation project based at the Yale Center for International and Area Studies at Yale University. So here we you see that they've already indicated who they are, and it's a documentation of genocide. Further on, they go on to say, since 1994, the CGP has been working to document war crimes, genocide, and crimes against humanity committed by the Khmer Rouge regime in Cambodia, 1975 to 79. The documentation is intended to support the investigation and prosecution of individuals who committed genocide, human rights violations, and war crimes in Cambodia. Now, further down, it says, an important aspect of this investigation has been the mapping of genocide sites throughout Cambodia. And I should say, Your Honor, as an aside, when I read the word genocide, I'm thinking of the legal term as opposed to a political term or social term that often is used by 
by uh, journalists or politicians. I'm thinking of it from the legal context because when this document is being introduced, we are in a court of law. It goes on to say that this map collection presents the results of field visits to more than 500 genocide sites in 22 of Cambodia's 24 provinces and so on and so forth. Now, I don't wish to read any further than that, but I mean here, this document clearly should not come in. If they wish to bring it in, uh, they should have the authors, Susan E. Cook, at least according to the internet, I Google her, uh, she's an anthropologist, not a lawyer. Uh, the other gentleman, Matthew Fledland, Fledland, he's a cartographer, yet they're using these terms. Now, if they wish to come in to, to, to show that they went, they visited these sites, and this was what was found at the sites, fine. But they've identified the sites as genocide sites. Of course, the question, another question is, why is this uh, document relevant? And I leave it to your honors to decide uh, whether it is relevant or not. Another document uh, worth noting is D366 uh, slash 7.1.415. It's a booklet of photographs which also contains interpretive comments. So it's not just photographs, but there are also comments. Comments, as far as we are concerned and what we submit, are statements, unsworn statements that will be coming in. And we would not have the opportunity to cross-examine those individuals who made those comments. So if your honors were to rely on any photographs, we certainly would object to your honors accepting as fate, at fate value anything that was represented as, a com as an interpretive comment to a photograph, unless, of course, there was independent indicia of, co of corroboration, the same objection that I've made on previous occasions. And I know, Your Honors, that I'm testing your patience with some of this, but uh, I want to make sure that our position is clear. And to the extent that I am repeating myself from the previous occasion, I apologize, but such is the nature of uh, these proceedings. I do believe, however, that I will, I will finish today. So there, there is a silver lining on the horizon. Audio and video. Uh, and video. That's the next topic. Our position is that audio and video recordings must not be admitted unless they are demonstrated to be authentic, relevant, and reliable. I think with audio it's rather important to, to ensure that they are authentic. Uh, if they contain witness interviews, they must not be admitted unless we have the opportunity to confront those who are being interviewed <coughs> uh, or those who are commenting on the videos. And we say this because uh, we think it's terribly important that if you show a video and someone is, is giving, uh, is providing information which can be interpreted as evidence, which goes to the acts and conducts of the accused, it would be a violation of our, of our client's right to confront that witness if he or she were not here the, uh, to give evidence. One example, for instance, is D232-110-1. Slash 1.149 I'll repeat again. D232-110-1. 
two three two B slash B one one zero slash one point one point four nine R Boon from Boon Air. It's not available in English. Should be rejected unless it's provided in all three languages. Uh, this is a recording, as we understand it, of a witness TCW dash five three six. I don't wish to. Uh, Mention the uh, the individual. Uh, this is a classic example of what I've indicated in, uh, before. If, for instance, someone is on the list of witnesses, then rather than have evidence such as this come in prior to the witness, the better practice would be for the witness to come in, give his or her evidence, and then, if it's necessary to show the recording. Uh, the video, uh, then that's fine. If the witness does not come in, then the prosecution or the party who's trying to have the, uh, the evidence admitted can certainly make a, another submission for the admission. That's, that's our position, Your uh, Next category, international communication. And again, I may be repeating myself, but uh, we have discussed these sort of documents in the past in great detail. And we have noted that uh, these documents should not be admitted, although if they are admitted, uh, little weight, if any, should be given to them unless they are independently corroborated by other sorts of evidence. One example, for instance, is D2-15.1. This is an interview uh, entitled K. Pox, Pox Autobiography. Our position is that this is mislabeled and it shouldn't come in because it's not part of an international communication to start with. Another one is D366-7.1.191, it's labeled International Communication, but it actually is a royal decree pardoning Mr. Ng Suri. There are 158 documents of International Communications in this sort of category. I certainly don't have time to go through every single one of them. Again, I would submit, Your Honor, when we're dealing with these large amounts of documents, it is not sufficient enough for the prosecution to provide a table and then say, let the defense object to any one of them, otherwise all of them should come in. The prosecution since they are the moving party to get these documents in, should go through every single one and demonstrate why every single one of them is relevant and reliable and meets all other criteria and therefore should be admitted. International media reports. Again, we've discussed this in the past. It is our submission that these sorts of Media reports uh, should not be admitted. In this sort of uh, rubric of documents, you have the FIBIS reports, you've got articles by newspapers such as the New York Times and the Chicago Tribune. To what extent these reports or articles from the media are accurate, no one knows. 
we submit that the better practice would be not to have them admitted. If admitted, the need to be corroborated. With the FIBIS report, we understand it was the CIA that was uh, documenting this, and, 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 and there may be, for instance, documents of a similar nature coming from the French embassy in Thailand or some other government because they may have been listening at the same time. And to that extent, where you have reports that are more or less saying the same thing, obviously you have independent indicia and you can give those reports some weight. But having an article by a journalist, for instance, where the journalist doesn't come in to give evidence and is unknown how uh, that, uh, what was actually seen and what was actually reported, how accurate it might have been uh, by the journalist, with no opportunity to cross-examine the journalist, we submit, unless this corroborating evidence shouldn't come in. The next category deals with academic articles and analytical reports and books. I think our position is rather clear that uh, books and analytical reports should not be admitted uh, unless the authors come in to give evidence. Uh, as simple as that. Many uh, have written books about the period of 75 to 79. Before that, after that, some are historians, some are journalists, uh, some are actually eyewitness events, perhaps before 75 or after 79. Some conducted interviews with, uh, with various individuals and the product of those individuals. The product of those interviews are the books themselves. Uh, we submit that uh, these, this sort of material should not be coming in unless the witness, uh, unless the, uh, the author comes in and is subject to cross-examination. Anything that was prepared as an analytical report by the OCP should automatically be excluded unless the author comes in. Uh, especially uh, if the author is only about oh, 100 meters away from us and comes here every day uh, and is on the payroll. Uh, so I think to have someone who provided, who prepared a report for the OCP who may have even testified in 001, for an example, Craig Etcherson, they should have to come in and give evidence uh, concerning those analytical reports. And I'll, I'll go back on this, on this matter for those who have, for those documents that may have come in in 001, uh, or for those analysts from the OCP who may have testified in 001, it matters not, because as I've indicated, uh, we were not privy to that case, we were not party uh, to that trial, and what the lawyers for Doik may or may not have done for their client, which may have been appropriate for Doik, is not necessarily appropriate uh, for Mr. Inksery. The next category, Your Honors, are rogatory reports. And as I've indicated in my previous remarks, some rogatory reports actually contain witness statements and statements by OCIJ investigators. So it's not just a report such as Today we went to such and such province and we did X, Y, and Z. See attached uh, interviews. But actually, the reports themselves contain witness summaries. Or you have critical uh, observations or statements made by OCIJ investigators. Now we would submit that these reports should not be admitted. 
if they are to be admitted, they can only be admitted or should only be admitted. Uh, if those uh, who prepare the reports come in and give evidence. For example, D91 D91 slash 29 contains not only the identity and location of potential witnesses, but also brief interviews with four witnesses. These are statements. So if the robotory report comes in, Your Honors, those statements come in. The witnesses don't come here to be testified, yet the prosecution later we will be using those statements prepared by the OCIJ of a witness who never came and testified as a basis of supporting something in their closing argument or their final brief. And it makes it virtually impossible for the defense to go through every single one of this, the uh, pieces of evidence, to try to demonstrate uh, how prejudicial this sort of a of a blanket admission as the prosecution would want you to adopt would have on the defense. Another example is D91-27, which describes the interviews of MFA staff relating to the role of Mr. Ng Sri. Now here, this is clearly an interview, it's a statement, and it goes or touches upon the acts and conduct of Mr. Ng Sri. So if we were to allow this document to come in, without those, uh, those individuals who were interviewed to be, be cross-examined, it would be a violation of Mr. Ng Sri's right of confrontation. Frankly, I have to confess, I don't see the purpose of these derogatory reports coming in as evidence. If there's something in them that was said by a particular witness that is available, then it's for the, the, the moving part to make an application with the court and to suggest that a particular witness come in. If the witness is coming in, then there's no need to have the summary because the best evidence is the witness's testimony. But what, how much weight, what sort of value can a regulatory report have? Unless, of course, what you're trying to do is, for lack of a better term, sneak in evidence through this sort of a document and to say, well, it was, pre it was prepared by the OCIJ and therefore, since they're an institution of this, uh, of this establishment, it should be coming in. So that's our position on rogatory reports. The next topic, Your Honors, I'm on to the civil party document. So I finished with the prosecution documents, and I believe uh, I may even finish uh, 10 minutes ahead of schedule. So we may have an early night off. Uh, okay. Now, the, uh, I understand the civil parties are having some translation problems, and will uh, I support what was said by the uh, team concerning that? But uh, if you look at some of the documents that they're, that they're presenting, Your Honors, and I'm just going to go through a couple of them because I have some concerns here. One document appears to be a paper prepared by a student at Yale University. It's D250-3.37. Genocide and 
uh, irredentism under democratic Kampuchea, 75 to 79. By Kanika Mac. And then in the footnote, it shows that he's currently a second year master's candidate in international relations at Yale. Of course, who else is at Yale? Uh, Mr. Kiernan. And when you read this, and you read Mr. Kiernan's, uh, no, one of his latest books, Blood and Soil, Kenan, which deals with genocide in general, it appears that the theme from the opening paragraph of this paper is one of Mr. Kiernan's thesis is concerning uh, genocide uh, in various societies. But if you look at the beginning of this particular document, it starts off with in the path, in the path of ge to genocide. Christopher Browning presents an overview of the debate between intentionalist and functionalist interpretations of the Holocaust. Talks about Hitler. And then it goes on and tries to make a comparison between Hitler's Nazi Germany and Democratic Kampuchea. And frankly, I'm wondering, we are wondering, where does this fit in to case 0021, let alone, how can this possibly be evidence? A paper prepared by a student, although, albeit from a very fine university, under no doubt some good guidance, nonetheless, why is this sort of document being tendered to be admitted for case 002-1? And if such a document is to come in, effectively, this individual is being treated as, a, as an expert, as a historian. The defense should be entitled to cross-examine this individual. And therefore, we object to this sort of document. But another good example is D250 slash 6 slash 3.36 D250 slash 3.36 The Khmer Krum and the Khmer Rouge Trials how is that relevant to our case? Now, who, who prepared this? Well, this is a legal advisor to DC CAM, someone who has been promoting DC CAM and promoting uh, and advocating, and in fact, noting, uh, make, giving legal opinions out there. So, uh, he is biased. We submit, but be that as it may, if we go at the first paragraph, which is sort of the abstract of the article, of course, the end says, in this article, I briefly review the predicament of the lowland Khmers under Khmer Rouge rule and ask a legal question relevant to the proceedings at the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia, ECC. Poland. Should Poland. Khmer Rouge atrocities against Khmer Krum be treated any differently than abuses against other segments of the population? Now let me be very clear on where the injury defense stands on this issue. It is our position that the trial, the trials before the ECCC should be as expansive as possible, as inclusive as necessary. It is for the prosecution, the OCIJ, and the trial chamber to decide that. The prosecution has the power and independence to proceed. The investigative judges do their thing, and you, Your Honors, have the discretion. So it is not our, we are not trying to exclude any group 
of individuals. Nor do we wish to be perceived in that way. We do not want to victimize any victims. We certainly do not want to exclude any civil parties. But as far as our understanding is concerned, what is contained in this particular article is not relevant, does not relate to the case 0023. Perhaps it may be relevant at some other trial down the road. But as far as, as, far as I understand, as far as I understand from reading the, uh, the paragraphs of the closing order to which we are uh, here, uh, to uh, to litigate this article and the contents of this article are not relevant. Another document, Your Honor, is DOJ Rule 366 3667.1.76. And this is uh, titled The Samlot Rebellion and its Aftermath, 1967 to 70, The Origins of Cambodia's Liberation Movement, Part 1 by Ben Kiernan. Now, again, as I've indicated earlier, we would object to these sorts of working papers coming in unless they are relevant, but more importantly, unless the authors would come in and to be available to be cross-examined. I leave it up to your honors to decide whether this is actually relevant to the proceedings uh, that we have before us. But certainly, we take exception to that. And in a in similar vein, we have another document by uh, the same author, The Survival of Cambodia's Ethnic Minorities, D250-3.212. And again, it's by the Cultural Survival. Um, that's who published it. And at the very end, we find out that it's Mr. Kiernan who actually uh, published it in the fall of 1990. Again, uh, it is our respectful submission that this is not relevant, but the, the, the author should come in and be subject to cross-examination. And the same thing goes with document 250 3.29. 250-3.29. This is an article of Cambodia's uh, ethnic Vietnamese minority rights in domestic politics. It's by Ramses Ammer, political scientist. So, uh, Your Honors, I think when you look at what the civil parties are, the 10 documents that they're trying to have admitted plus the others, you have yet to see, uh, is our respectful submission that the documents uh, need to be expressly relevant to the paragraphs that you have singled out and selected from the closing order for case 002 1. And what I've shown you thus far in our humble submissions are not relevant. Thank you, Your There is, uh, concerning the documents that were submitted by the Kyusong Bon team, um, they submitted uh, 78 uh, documents. Um, and one in particular document that we, that we would definitely object to uh, is the interview of Ying Turit by Elizabeth Becker, and that's D108-5.1. Comma D28. Comma D28. For the obvious reasons, Your Honor. Uh, 
it is our submission that uh, interit is no longer a part of this case, that we have to be vigilant not to be going into, uh, into areas where we may not be able to uh, confront certain witnesses concerning uh, what is being presented against uh, Mr. I mean, Ms. Ms. Uh, yeah, Ms. So, uh, that's our position. We leave it up to your discretion to decide what if, are, uh, what if other, the other documents presented by the accused upon to what extent uh, they are admissible. Although, as we've indicated in the past, books, and they've listed Kiernan, Chandler, and uh, any books, or even Kiusampon's thesis. We submit that by doing so, uh, the parties should be entitled to cross-examine, to confront the authors. So that's our, that's our position, and we want to be consistent with our position. And as promised, Your Honor, uh, I believe I'm finished uh, today, 10 minutes early. Uh, I have nothing further. Uh, I hope uh, it wasn't too tedious. Thank you. Yum so Thank you. Yum so much. Yum so much. Yum so Yum so much. Yum so លោកខេសំផនតាមកាលវិភាកដែលបានក្រុងទុកគឺត្រូវនៅធ្វើនៅរៀលថ្ងៃស្អែកទេប៉ុន្តែលើនេះពេលវេលាបានលឿនទៅ